there is something that <clears throat> might be called the secret of the infinite way, <clears throat> not because it has kept the secret from anybody, because it appears all throughout the writings, but I use the word the secret in the sense of the basic essence, the basic teaching something that escapes me. Uh, let us say, what is the infinite way all about? What is it that separates it from any religious teaching that is in the entire world today? What is the one thing that separates it from any and every teaching? and puts it in an exclusive uh, place by itself. And that is this. <clears throat> it isn't a teaching. It is an experience. The essence of it is an experience. And I can only illustrate that in this way. As you know, its original uh, start came when I realized that there is no God in the human world. That if there were a God in the human world, you couldn't have rape, arson, murder, wars, dens of iniquity drug addiction. None of these could happen in the presence of God. Man's inhumanity to man. Even working in a coal mine couldn't be in the presence of God. So that everything that's taking place on the face of the globe is taking place in the absence of God, and only because there is no God in this scene. Now this was the original unfoldment that was given to me in 1900, some, sometime after 1909, that started me on the search. Because I have never doubted that there is a God, but now at least I know that there is no God in this world and I know that all of the going to church and praying isn't going to bring one here. Because people have been going to church to pray since before the ancient Hebrew days. And continuously ever since. And they've done it with Hebrew prayers and Protestant prayers and Catholic prayers and Vedanta prayers and every kind of prayers that's ever been known. And the world keeps right on falling apart. Now with that for a start, the inner search began. Where is God? What is God? How do we bring God into our experience? Because it must be possible. And eventually, the experience took place. This is in that late 1928 experience. And there was no message. There were no words. There were no rules, no principles given. 
there was just an experience that couldn't be described because it was just a matter of uh, Well, whereas in one moment I was just every human being, in the next moment my body was well, and all of the human habits had gone. A healing power was present. And a whole new life was begun. The old life was dead, a new one was begun, but without a teaching, without any principles, without any laws, just by virtue of an experience. Well, <clears throat> once you start examining the lives of the mystics, you will find that that's what happened to them. None of them ever... studied to become a mystic, each one in turn had an experience, and that experience uh, changed their lives. And as a matter of fact, in every case they were enabled to give that experience to those who became their disciples and followers. And some of those were enabled to give that experience to their disciples and followers. The only thing is that it became a lessening experience with each generation until it died out. Now, <clears throat> those who have done healing work in the message of the infinite way must know that there is nothing in the teaching that heals. I do not care what it is in the writings that you might know and repeat. It isn't going to heal anybody of anything, including yourself. You are not going to heal until you have an experience. And you have to have an experience with every healing. Until the time comes when you are so living in the experience that you may only have to renew it once or twice or three times a day and then all the other healings take place because you are in the experience. Now, To heal, you close your eyes you may have to remind yourself at first I'm not going to God to get any God power I'm certainly not uh, going to try to heal man whose breath is in his nostril. I'm only here to realize the Christ. To feel the presence of the Christ. And in its own unknown way, unknown to us, The discords evaporate, harmony appears, and it would seem as if a sick person got well, or a bad person got good, or a poor person became more affluent. But that isn't it at all. What has really happened is that more of the spiritual nature of God has come into manifestation. And then, speak, Lord, thy servant heareth, and we attain that listening attitude until 
we feel some measure of a release within, sometimes even receive a message. And then our part of the work is done. Sometimes the healing is instantaneous, sometimes it takes place after the second or third time, and sometimes you may have to work with someone for a year or two or three. That all has to do with their receptivity, their ability to yield, and to the heights that you attain. So that <clears throat> you might rightly say, then what's the good of all this teaching, and what is the good of all the years that we uh, study these books? And I will say to you that the experience will not come without that. In other words, the study, the practice, the listening, the reading, these are the steps that break down the mortal sense in which we were born, that enable us to die to mortal sense and to be reborn. In other words, without all of those years from 1909 until 1928, in which I was breaking my heart and head trying to discern how to find God and probably without the reading that I was doing in the Bible and the Christian science writings the experience might not have happened. In other words every single effort that I made from 1909 on to discover the secret, to break through the darkness, uh, was a helpful thing leading me ultimately to the experience. And that is why I have said in the writings that it makes no difference what your background of study is. If your object was to discover truth, learn truth, seek truth, it doesn't make any difference if uh, you were studying with the Hottentots. It doesn't make any difference if you were with some paganistic teaching. It doesn't make any difference what you were studying, as long as the motive was to seek the experience, the realization, the understanding of God. Ultimately, you would be led there, because people have been led there through paganistic teachings, through Christian teachings, non-Christian teachings. People have been led there in every different direction and have reached there. The goal is to be reached no matter what mode or method you use. If uh, the basic motive is true, in other words, as long as you're just in metaphysics seeking to uh, demonstrate health and harmony and uh, uh, supply and companionship, you have no hope of attaining it. In spite of how successful you may be in human demonstration, you still never, never will attain spiritual awareness. That only comes when uh, you have died to caring about the outer scene and uh, are willing to take life as it is and uh, work from within toward the goal of God-realization. Now, we are very fortunate in the message of the Infinite Way that certain things since my first experience have been revealed to me that make it easier for anyone else with the right desire to attain it. And I want to illustrate that for you. Scripture says, to know him aright is life eternal. And uh, 
On that statement, you can afford to rest. That is the truth. If you can come to know God aright, you will attain the experience, the God experience, the Christ experience, the spiritual experience. And therefore, we have as our first principle to know the nature of God. Always you will discover in every class that we have three subjects that are never missed. The nature of God, the nature of error, the nature of prayer. Now in teaching beginners, the major part of the classwork must be on the nature of God, the nature of error, the nature of prayer. As they become uh, more advanced, a teaching can be on that can comprise only one half of the teaching. In other words, if you're giving an hour's class, uh, one half of the hour should be given to the nature of God, the nature of error, the nature of prayer. When you come down to more advanced students, you can encompass that in 10 minutes. But in my experience, there has not yet come the time when I can omit those three from any class. And I can promise you that you can go through every infinite weight class that's ever been given and you will discover that I have not omitted the nature of God, the nature of error, the nature of prayer. And the reason is <coughs> that with this for a foundation, the experience is not difficult. Now watch why. To begin with, the world believes and all religions teach that God is a great power and if only you can get in touch with that power it will overcome your sins, diseases, lacks, limitations and all your troubles. And as long as you believe that you're so far removed from ever attaining the experience that you're hopelessly lost. The only possibility you would have while following such religions or teachings is that your own basic search for God would overcome it and in the end you would surmount it and attain the experience. Not because of the teaching you're following, in spite of it. Because there is no such God. And the longer you seek to reach such a God, the further away that God is. There is no such God that overcomes the errors of the world. If there were, in all these thousands of years, it would have been discovered and the woes of the world would be over. So, you must start your student with the realization that we are not going to God for a God power. We are going to God to commune, to tabernacle with God, to experience God, to feel God, to speak to God and to hear God, but not for a power. Any thought of power that enters your consciousness separates you from God. Now, all religions teach that God rewards and that God punishes. And as long as your student is under that belief, you cannot lead them into their harmony. Because they will seeking to be so good that God will reward them and to give all, up all their errors so that God won't punish them. And all of this time they're they're in darkness because God has no interest in your goodness and will not reward it. 
and God has no interest in your sins and will not punish it. Is there any reward or punishment for goodness and sins? Of course there is. Of course there is. <coughs> we set in motion the rewards and the punishments, but not the way the religions of the world teach. Not by being good or by being bad. That does not set in uh, motion the rewards or the punishments. What sets in motion the rewards and the punishments is if you sow to the Spirit, you set in motion your freedom, your release from this world. If you sow to the flesh, you sow to corruption. And now again, we do not use these statements in the way that the world's religions use them. You must impart to your student that sowing to the Spirit means acknowledging Spirit as the source and cause of all that is. Acknowledging spirit as uh, the activity of divine grace. Acknowledging spirit as uh, the presence substance, power, law, activity of being. Acknowledge him in all thy ways. Acknowledge spirit in all thy ways. Acknowledge that spirit is the source of all. And then you will discover that it will not be very long until that acknowledgement dissolves your sins, false appetites, fears, doubts, greeds, lusts, made ambitions. Now the moment you try to dissolve these, you are in psychology. And psychology cannot succeed because it cannot make you other than you are. Whatever your nature is, that's what you're going to remain until something enters your consciousness that brings about a change. Let me illustrate that. <clears throat> we have here in Hawaii uh, an experience that transcends perhaps uh, anything that the world could believe. We have a man in prison who has been in so many times since boyhood that he is just the state's peck's bad boy, only very bad. Uh, serving one term of life imprisonment for murder and another awaiting execution for murder, a second murder. That's being fairly bad. But the worst of it is that at no time could he have been mentally right because he'd been vicious. So vicious that they couldn't allow him to be near other people. Well, <clears throat> just to make the story very short, one of our students is working in the prison. And the prosecutor who sent him up on those two charges for life imprisonment and for execution has gone before the court to have him uh, no longer held on those two charges but getting ready for his parole. It's 
a long story, it's an interesting story, a fascinating one, but the boy is so completely healed that he is now doing painting, carving, all kinds of artwork that has gained recognition outside of the prison. Now, can you imagine a psychologist telling him how he ought to be good and how he ought to behave and how he should be and, and what they would have happened to them? Nothing could happen to him until something enters his consciousness. And that has to ha enter his consciousness through the experience of one who has experienced because it can't be anything human. It has to be something of a spiritual nature. All right? We have had not less than seven uh, babies, mongoloid babies, all of whom are now in school, taking their regular classes. Now you try to convince a mongoloid baby how to be a, a normal one, and you will know that you can't, and that there isn't any truth that you know that would do it. It has to be an experience. It has to be something within yourself that transcends yourself and performs it. But that something else won't happen while you are saying, Oh dear God, please uh, save this darling child who was so innocent, and, or please save this man. No, no, nothing of that nature will do it. And God wasn't doing it either. God didn't enter the prison. God didn't enter those children until someone who attains the God experience comes along. Then it happens. Some years ago, I received a letter from an institution in California. It seems that they have a an institution in California <clears throat> that handles the cases of all convictions of moral offenses of any and every nature. And those who are convicted have to agree to a certain period of treatment rather than just a jail term because California has acknowledged that uh, moral offenses are not crimes, they're the products of disease, of illness. And so anyone who wishes to avoid a year in uh, uh, San Quentin can uh, sign up for this institution in California where they receive psychiatric, psychological, and uh, help from... Uh, ministers, priests, rabbis, and they are undoubtedly doing a very fine work there. But I received a call from there for copies of our writings from one man, and this eventually spread to nine. And they were so enthused by what it was doing to them that they spoke to the head and eventually I was invited over there by the head of the institution and I spent the day with those boys there and an hour of that day with the head of the institution and a part of the day with one of the chaplains as a result of which we had some very fine healings now recently as a result of that experience we've had a call from another institution in California penal institution for the writings and from the uh, head chaplain asking more information about the nature of this work. Well now, <clears throat> whatever fruitage comes from this work in that regard or the healing of physical disease, 
you must understand, does not come because of uh, all the statements that are in the books, because then everyone who has those statements could go out and heal. But rather because the principles in those books, if they are studied and practiced and followed, will lead to this experience. And then when this experience comes, it is this experience that does the work. Once you begin to perceive then that God cannot be reached through the mind, you will be halfway home. You cannot reach God through your mind. It's been tried in every religious teaching in the world, in every philosophical teaching in the world, every metaphysical teaching in the world. You cannot reach God through your mind. You have got to bring your mind to a place of stillness to where you transcend the mind and your soul faculty receives God, receives the experience. You have a soul faculty, everyone in the world has because God created us in his own image and likeness. That means he incorporated in us the nature of his own being. Therefore, we have that within us that enables us to know God aright. See, in the days of the Bible writing, they didn't know the difference between a soul and a mind. They didn't know the difference between spirit and uh, the intellect. Except a few who were enabled to say that the letter killeth, it's the spirit that makes free. Paul saw that. A few saw that you must have discernment, not knowledge. The mystic who did the cloud of unknowing knew it, that you never will reach God through knowing. Only when you reach that altitude of consciousness of unknowing. And that doesn't mean ignorance. It means where the mind is at rest and the soul faculty. receives the things of God. Remember, remember always that <clears throat> while no one else may be in agreement with me, Paul is, that the natural man knoweth not the things of God. The natural man receiveth not the things of God. The natural man is not under the law of God. And the natural man functions through his mind. How else does the natural man function? Only through his mind. Even the things he does with his body, he functions through his mind. He can't live without his uh, mind. He can't move his body without his mind. He can't love without his mind. Nothing can a man do without his mind. But with his mind, he can't reach God. Therefore, if you know enough about the nature of God as it is revealed in the infinite way, you will know enough to stop trying to reach God and relax and let God reach you. In the moment that ye think not, the bridegroom cometh. The bridegroom is the Christ. In the moment that ye think not, that you are not thinking, that you are at rest. Not in the moment when your mind is dead. Not in the mind when, in the moment when it's unconscious. In the moment when you are not thinking, and you're receptive and responsive and... Uh, your soul faculty 
unites with God. It's called union with God. It's called marriage with God. And it is when you are so still that the soul of you, which is the individualization of God, comes into awakening. Not that it awakens. No, no, no. You awaken to it. It doesn't awaken. Oh, the Spirit of God in you is in full bloom all of the time. It appears to awaken. But it is we who are awakening to it, but not through the mind. Now you can see that if your student is looking up to God and wanting God to do something and trying to get God to come down to them, that they're, they're out to lunch. They're just not around where God is. Therefore, you must reveal the nature of God. You must take from them all faith that God is going to reward their being good. If necessary, point out all the good people in the world who are suffering. And at the same time, all the bad people who are prospering. And pretty soon you, you will convince them that God doesn't reward good and God doesn't punish evil. Or whatever of reward or punishment comes is from within our own selves. Again, everyone teaches that God is a power. Oh, if you could just get God power, you'd fix everything that's right in the world. But you see, the nature of God is not power in that sense. It may be power in the sense that it maintains two times two as four, or it maintains H2O as water. But it is not power in the sense that it will do something to evil. Again, you have to show the nature of God as something that cannot be used because every religion of the world is using God. It is making of God a servant. Dear God, take care of my rent next month. Dear God, fix my digestive apparatus. Dear God, protect my child. God is always the servant, doing your will. But there is no such God. You are not going to make God do your will. You cannot influence God. Not by praying, not by being good, not by fasting, not by tithing. You cannot influence God, and unless you can make your students see that, you are not helping them to come toward the experience. Because once they have come to the realization, well, I can't influence God. I can't get God to do my will. They're apt to settle down in peace and quiet and say, well, God, maybe you can influence me. That would be a twist. And so you'll understand what the mystics mean when they say, you must surrender yourself to God. You must yield yourself to God. And you'll understand why Jesus could say, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Well, then it's foolish to have a will of our own to begin with, even a will to, to see our friends healed, even a will to see peace on earth. Let's not have any will at all and retire within as many times a day as we can find a minute and say, nevertheless, Father, not my will be done, but thine be done on earth as it is in heaven and relax and rest and then be a beholder and see what God's will is. Maybe, maybe it would include peace on earth. 
If only we could let that will of God come through instead of treating it as if it was some kind of a servant that we are going to direct. Do you see why the God experience can come only when you have relaxed your personal efforts, when you have relaxed your mind, when you come to the realization that there's nothing personal about the activity of God, <coughs> in the sense that God would do any more for me than for you. And that too you must bring to your uh, uh, students. Never let them believe that God will do more for Jesus Christ or for me than for you or for them. There's no such God. God is not a super person that goes around and says, I, I will do this for you and I won't do it for you, or I'll do this for my good Hebrew people, but I won't do it for you Christian people. Isn't that nonsense? God must be understood as universal being. No exceptions in the laws of God. It could make no difference to God, white or black, Jew or Gentile, bond or free, saint or sinner, can make no difference whatsoever. Let the sinner just open the consciousness and God will be there just as fast as to a saint. And the Master even went so far as to say that God has more pleasure in one sinner that's redeemed <coughs> than 99 who think they're already pretty good. But it isn't so. It isn't that God has uh, more regard for one sinner or more pleasure in one sinner redeemed. No, because God is too pure to behold iniquity and God has no knowledge of any sinners. Actually, if you want to know what the activity of God is like, I can tell you. It is like light touching darkness. It doesn't do anything to darkness whatsoever. It doesn't heal it, correct it, change it, or move it. It just reveals there isn't any. And that's what the activity of God is like. In healing, it doesn't heal a disease. It just reveals that there is none. It doesn't reform a sinner. It reveals God's man who never sinned. No, no. There is that part of us which has never sinned, never been sick, was never born and will never die. And uh, the ac action of God is to reveal that man. To our sense, that may remove darkness, sin, disease, lack, but that's only to our limited sense. It doesn't really do it any more than light removes darkness. Light reveals the absence of darkness the non-entity of darkness, the non-existence of darkness. And so it is. That which we call a human being, the natural man, has no real existence. He has only an existence in the universal mind which is separate and apart from God. The whole of the human experience is you might say an imaginary experience, a dream experience, which takes place only in the universal mind which does not have its seat in God. And the proof of that is that in the moment that you can still that mind and the Spirit of God comes in, that man isn't here anymore. That man of sin, of disease, of death, he isn't here anymore. He's just as absent as the darkness when light touched it. And we say the old man has died and the new man has been reborn. But where did the old man go? He didn't go any place. He wasn't there to begin with. This, of course, 
you can only realize after you have yourself been lifted up in consciousness. Because the secret of the human mind is not known to psychiatrists or psychologists and for one reason. They are looking at the human mind with the human mind. And they have no possible way of doing that objectively, of withdrawing from the picture and seeing it as it is. And therefore, everything that's taught in psychiatry and everything that's taught in psychology is wrong. And when I say everything, I just mean 100%. Now, Dr. Jung began years ago to see that that was so. And so he began changing his teaching over into the spiritual, so that eventually he was able to say that every case that he healed of a man over 35 years of age was healed only through spiritual means. And every failure to heal of anyone over 35 years of age was the failure to lead that person to a spiritual teaching. And he said, not a church teaching. That will never save anyone. But a basic spiritual teaching, a basic religious teaching. That is, a religious teaching of the original master, not as it uh, filtered down through churches. Well, recently the man who is now the head of the Freudian psychiatric movement, professor in uh, Vienna, has made the same acknowledgement. That until we know God and until we become aware of the spiritual universe, we will not succeed. So they in Vienna are changing the Freudian teaching as they change the Jung teaching to bring it into a spiritual sphere. And what does a spiritual sphere mean? Let me sum it up for you this way. It's not a teaching, it's an experience. Until you come to an actual uh, experience of God, feeling of God, awareness of God, something or other that lets you know God is in spite of all that you can see out here to the contrary. Now, once you begin to see the subject of God in the way God is revealed in the message of the infinite way, your whole nature begins to change because you stop this mind trying to reach out to God. It, it, it stops you from praying. It makes you laugh at yourself when you think that God is here to do your will. It makes you laugh at yourself when you stop to think that you can influence God to do something that God isn't already doing. What kind of a God are you praying to? And so all of this begins to change your attitude and enable you to settle down and settle down. And then you come to the next subject the nature of error. What other world knows what error is? It's very evil. It's a terrible power. It's got the world in its grip. It's giving us juvenile delinquency and gambling and drug addiction and uh, rape, arson, and murder, wars. Oh, everybody knows what evil is. How do, how do you do something about it? If only we could get God. But, in this message, you have it clearly revealed in every book, in every class. The nature of error is the arm of flesh or nothingness. Is this not evil? This is the Master's teaching. Put up thy sword. Now 
Now, you will discover that almost as much attention is given in our writings to the nature of error as to the nature of God. We have lots of students who, for years and years, will say, oh, well, you know, Joe's touched a little bit on that subject, and uh, don't pay too much attention to it. But you'll notice that they're the ones who don't heal very well. Until they come to an awakening and find out that that's the mystery of the healing ministry. That's the history. When you can sit down in your healing work and not battle the appearance, not fight it, not try to remove germs out of somebody's body, not try to remove lumps and fevers, not try to remove insanity, but sit down quietly at peace put up thy sword resist not evil they have only the arm of flesh and you can rest in that inner peace and quiet and assurance that there is only one law, spiritual law. All else is imaginary. This experience can take over, and then the healing takes place. Now, until this last month, was there any more powerful law in Materia Medica than that sitting in a draft or getting wet feet would give you a cold? Wasn't that a pretty stiff law? You could hardly avoid a cold, could you, if you sat in a draft and, or got wet feet? Now all of a sudden, Materia Medica informs you it never was a law, it was a superstition. It was an old wives' tale, and you can't get a cold that way. Ah, yes, but you've had many a cold that way. Yeah, but it wasn't from uh, the wet feet or the... Uh, no, it was because we doctors frightened you and told you that that would give you the cold and you believed us. See that? Now, in the next five years, nobody in the world will ever catch a cold again from a draft or wet feet. Why? Well, everybody knows it's not a law. It was just a fairy tale. So they're not fearing it. Well, what is to prevent them saying that germs do not give disease? That we thought it did, but the germs are very natural, normal things. If God created all that he that created, maybe he created germs too. And therefore, our theory, making it a law that germs had to give you a disease. Why shouldn't they eventually come to the realization that germs do not cause disease when... We have been proving now for the last 90 years that we can heal germ diseases without antibiotics. Have we not? In Christian science, in unity, in new thought, in the infinite way, have we not been healing germ diseases? Why, we have made it impossible for tuberculosis to last by proving how many cases have been healed metaphysically. We have healed all kinds of grip and flu without medication of any kind. If germs were destructive powers causing disease, do you believe that we could have ever healed one case? No, not one. Not one. If there has ever been a case of tuberculosis healed spiritually, then germs are not the cause of tuberculosis. If there has ever been a case of flu healed, or pneumonia, or grip, then the whole germ theory is wrong. Because we have used none of these anti-germs to heal them. Nor have we exercised the power over germs or fevers. 
germs cause fevers. They've been whole, healed by the wholesale in every one of the metaphysical movements by people who really had it. So, while stating that error isn't power and the germs don't have power, will not heal anything. If you will work with that principle until the realization, of course it can't. Of course, if spirit is, if God is, then you will find the healing. And this will explain to you why many people cannot heal who are very good students of truth. Because as long as they have only the letter, they've only, they're only saying it with the mind. And it isn't the mind. It's the mind that causes it, so the mind is not going to cure it. It's only these beliefs in the mind that cause all these errors. And therefore, it's not going to be another belief in the mind that's going to cure it. You've got to transcend the mind. And when you've transcended the mind, all of these things that the mind declares are proven unreal. So, I give, to, give this to you. For yourselves, work earnestly with everything that the Infinite Way writings say about the nature of God, the nature of error. Because, when you have, you will now understand the nature of prayer. Prayer is no longer words or thoughts. Prayer is no longer asking God to do something or expecting something of God. Now prayer has got a whole new meaning. And as I see it, prayer is a state of silence in which I become receptive to the Word of God. Prayer is a state of silence where the mind is still and the spiritual faculty is alert and receives the grace of God. This is prayer. So prayer has nothing to do with getting God to do something. Prayer has nothing to do with getting God's power to destroy something. Prayer has nothing to do with influencing God. God forbid that prayer should be used to tell God what to do or influence God or bribe God. Prayer is a state of silence in which we commune, in which we receive God's grace where every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God becomes power. And we become the receptivity through which it flows. And that's why the Master could say, I am a servant. And in this relationship, that's all we are. We're a servant here, receiving the grace of God and allowing it to flow. And anybody gets egotistical about that is going to lose their head. Because the, the closer you get to being a master, the more of a servant you will become. Because the more you will realize it isn't I or my own self that's doing this. No. It's the flow that's taking place through me. And there's your true sense of humility. Humility doesn't mean being less than somebody else. It doesn't mean being less than anybody on the face of the earth. It means that as an avenue of God, you're nothing but the avenue. Never, never will you believe that you have power to heal if you understand the infinite way. Never will you believe that you have power to reform somebody or to give them illumination. No, you will understand yourself to be the instrument of God's grace. And the benefit that you can be to anyone is in proportion to their receptivity and their devotion and their sacrifice of self. Otherwise, all the rich people could go around hiring us and uh, 
we could make them uh, spiritually great, but we can't. Thank you.